Hey guys, how you doing? Good. Um, so it looks like I have some questions here um, that we're going to ask, and um, I guess I'll, I'll ask them, and then we'll get some input from the experts here. So um, one of the questions that we have here right now is, is, it says here, how does PPC fit into inbound marketing strategy? Anybody care to answer that? Well, um, with, uh, with PPC, it's a testing ground for anything that works, and you can get results right away, and you can use as a blueprint for your inbound strategy. Also, um, I think we need to define PPC as well. Um, so uh, at Strive Group, uh, the big part of PPC is that we actually started with social PPC um, and went back into Google. Um, and social PPC is a way for us to amplify our content um, during that buyer's journey. And so we found that um, uh, especially stuff like LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a very powerful tool. We're finding huge success with LinkedIn. And during um, people self-identify their interests through groups and through skills. And you'd be surprised at how much that ties into that information-seeking journey. And so we found that, that PPC has been uh, a huge part of that inbound marketing uh, process. Can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, how you go into LinkedIn or the social networks like Facebook and target that? So I don't think I don't know if everybody understands sure. about how you can target based on you know job title and things like that. Maybe Absolutely. you could expand on that. I'll put it into context. Um, we just ran a campaign for a um, healthcare furniture company. So, you know, everyone uh, wants to work with big brands. I get to work with the middle market. They're uh, they're fun to work with, but we're talking you know ten to fifty million. But we're working with a CEO, which is great. But um, so recently we put an entire guide together on uh, healthcare trends, um, specifically for interior designers. So we were able to go into LinkedIn directly, identify people that are part of interior designer groups, healthcare groups, do overlays uh, regionally. That is a very, very targeted piece that we can go to a very targeted group. And um, the, I mean, I can give you results. Typically you're looking at a B2B lead in the realm of, if you ask HubSpot about 40 to $50 per lead, ours was $4. <laughs> so, um, you know, if I can give one piece of advice, I know at, at Google and Bing, those are very important too, but think about PPC outside of that as well. There's some powerful tools out there to get hyper, hyper targeted. Sure. It, maybe you guys could talk a little bit about the, the search, you know, how we would use maybe top of funnel type keywords to, you know, in PPC to, to leverage that paid search for, you know, the same idea that we're doing with the social. Is there that ability to do that in search too? So the one way I look at it is that before you undertake a very, very expensive SEO campaign, SEO audit of your site, um, because you have an idea that these certain keywords you're going to do well in, why not spend an extra couple hundred dollars, throw it on, you know, Bing ads, throw it on AdWords, doesn't really matter, and see if your assumptions are correct. Um, I think too often some people just say, okay, I feel this is correct, and mm -hmm. therefore they execute, as opposed to trying it out, spending a couple hundred bucks and seeing what happens. Great. Um, so I, I think the, the big takeaway here was that, you know, that paid search can be used for content discovery. So, you know, when you're creating content today, it's one thing to just publish it, but what a lot of people, I think, forget to do, and you guys would agree probably with this, is they forget to promote it. And you can do that through paid tools, whether it's through the search engines in Bing and Google or whether it's through social networks like Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, let's go on to a couple more questions here. So um, it, it looks here, this is a good question. You know, are there specific businesses where paid search doesn't or is not effective um, or a good fit? You know? I, I could answer that. Um, usually businesses that have long sales cycles uh, businesses that have low margins, businesses that are commodity products. But if you have those problems, uh, you probably wouldn't, you have uh, more problems. Than Sounds like you should get a new business model. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you see that sometimes. <laughs> Anybody else have any insight on that? Or do you think it's or a different opinion even possibly? Or do you think search, paid search is good for everybody, period? It, so my philosophy is you don't know unless you try. Um, uh, I'll give you another example. Working with a large personal injury firm, they were not into, they, they didn't even want to get into that realm. They thought, um, you know, this is a very involved 
process. Uh, most of our, 99% of our work comes in through referrals. Um, we ran a very simple uh, one month campaign. Um, and if you talk about a, uh, a conversion, what that means for a personal injury firm, one of the top in, in the country, that's a lot of money, 10 in a single month. And that was all through display, which is really interesting. I can get more into that if you'd like, but that blew their, like maybe it blew the water out of the, out of the office in terms of the, the capability of doing that. Um, and, and that would, to, to me, that wouldn't seem like a, a suitable, that's a very long sales cycle. So my take with, with uh, clients is, you know, we make, we try to make assumptions and figure out the market, but there's nothing more powerful than what Google tells us when we try. They're real, that is data that, that is extremely powerful. And here's the, other, the flip side. Even if it doesn't work, what we found for that personal injury firm is that the point of convergence from the search to people picking them was people that were looking for the best. It was top, it was uh, the best. So even at that very level, we could reinforce some branding principles with them and also feed in to the SEO. So now our entire blogging strategy is about identifying them as the best in the industry. Because when, you when you're injured, uh, there's a particular group that say, I, will, I don't care who it is, I want the best to represent my, my loved one. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, it leads me to another question that we see happen a lot of times is, you know, should a business bid on their branded name and variations of it? Is, do, you, do you agree with that or you shouldn't and, and, and why? So, so my, my personal opinion is that if you look at search, it's intent. It's at the bottom of the funnel. Why are you spending all this money on display or billboard ads and everything else like that? And you're going to have a competitor potentially change that conversation and change that nature. Um, so for me, it's just a no-brainer. Um, the clicks should be cheap enough, and at the end of the day, if you tie it into your analytics, it should become very, very apparent whether or not you should be bidding on your keywords or not. Okay. Um, I got a question for you guys, and let's talk about the difference in you know bidding for search versus display, and um, pros and cons, and 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 how you see them being differently. I can answer that. Would, well, with search, you're basically matching your solution with uh, people's problems. And so you, you, you're going to definitely get a direct response right away, whereas displays more towards interruption marketing a little. It's almost a, a, a old school type of frame of mind where you're, they're reading a blog on, on, a, on a site and your, your banners, banner ads are there. And so it's a little bit different in what you want to do, but display is excellent for remarketing, for people that already visit your brand or have uh, a need for your services, a previous need, and also great for similar audiences in PPC where Google can help you match the profile, the web browser profiles of these people and put your ads in front of people. Great. So uh, uh, just to follow up with that, I think there's uh, one, uh, a few key points is that Technically, your display ad can head at a point where someone's really far down the information uh, solution seeking funnel. They may be on a blog saying, uh, you know, I have a particular condition, I need a, an attorney. And they're literally, they've, they've gone through that. They are at a point where they're looking to hire someone. So the typical thing with the typical approach display is, you know, get as many repetitions in front of impressions in front of people. Uh, the brand will finally resonate. You. There's also the case to be made that they could be at a particular point where that display really can trigger, trigger at that particular moment. The other thing too is um, I want to talk about remarketing because I think that's a very important part here. And I, this is totally anecdotal and, and in particular situations, I think remarketing is fantastic, but just be careful that you don't come across as creepy. This is a lot of people have been telling me this lately that um, there is something to be said about a company knowing too much about you and and remarketing. So if you go buy, you know, you go to a place and buy a, a, a th looking at a pair of shoes, there is something to be said about that remarketing. Um, it's they're almost pushing it a little too far, and that's that's entirely anecdotal. And I don't want to, and I, I do see points. I mean, I we just bought a software solution because they just kept hitting me, and I was like, okay, yes, you, you've got me. But there's particular situations where people. You know, people are sharing computers, too. They don't want someone else to know where they've been uh, shopping. I have friends come up to me, and they'll say, 
why why are there ads coming up from places already visited? I mean, here in this audience, we have a we're fairly comprehensive in terms of our knowledge. A lot of our audience actually has no idea how you how you figure that out. So I, I just be careful about it. So speaking of that, do you guys offer any tips around when you're remarketing to be, I guess, less creepy? Um, you know, what would you do to do that? What are those tips? Um, well, one great remarketing campaign that I saw was that sometimes it just might help to acknowledge it. Like, I don't know whether it's yeah. your own internal studies that you found that after you they've seen this many impressions, wouldn't it be great to change it up again and say, hey, by the way, we noticed you know, we're putting all of these ads because we think it's great or yeah, whatever. Exactly. That's cool. That's a great tip. Um, I, I know for us, like when we do remarketing, one of the things that we do to prevent creepiness is we do sometimes impression capping. So you can cap your impressions or what's even better is you can now lay in keywords on your remarketing so it has some context. So what I mean by that is like your ads aren't just following people around no matter what website you go on that offers display, but it's only showing up when the page is relevant to the keyword. So it looks like it's a more like it's a well-placed ad as opposed to an ad that's following you around. Exactly. Another thing you can do is, you know, change up your creative. Like you need to have lots of different creatives and think about the buying cycle of your customers when it comes to, you know, the remarketing. Because most people, they have like one set of creative or maybe two that they're split testing, but they're not actually thinking about it. So example, let's say, you know, you're in the real estate niche or something like that, and you have a 90 or 120 day buying cycle, you might start off with more informational type offers. And then as you get closer and closer to the end of it, it might be more of a call to action. If you were a realtor, hey, why don't you connect with me to help you buy or sell your house, right? So think about what that buying journey is um, for your customer and how they engage with you that way. Those are some other ways to become a little bit less creepy with your marketing, but remarketing is great. Yeah. Just to touch on that, on, did anybody catch that Reddit post where some guy spent five bucks on Facebook yeah. retargeting ad? And yeah, just do, yeah. <laughs> that was fun. I think I'll do that next week to all my staff. Um, okay, so let's let's go and ask you just a couple more couple of questions. What, how are we on time? time? Time Nazis, we're good? How much time do we have left? 15. Oh, we got lots of time. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, we talked about that. What about, um, you know, uh, can we talk a little bit about... Um, how people and any tips on how you're using similar audiences like a lot of social networks I don't know if you guys are aware of this or not but you can upload or once you build an audience and cookie people you they'll allow you to actually create a new audience based on that data but can you guys tell me some creative and interesting ways that you're using you know that to build PPC campaigns uh oh I think you know you can you can leverage a lot of that data to formulate what we like to call personas internally to actually build that audience and and frankly you can you can leverage your existing data or you can go purchase data to reinforce that persona so I think personas are good to a certain degree because they tend to crystallize that audience or a particular audience in the mind of your um, your your customer so when we when we talk to our clients and we'll say we'll give them very loose audiences or characteristics it doesn't really doesn't mean anything to them until we actually formulate it into something a little more creative in, in, in terms of um, an actual individual so I guess from, from our side, there's so much data and there's so much information, but the challenge a lot of times is how do we actually crystallize that to make sense um, to uh, e our internal teams and also our, our customers as well. So, I, I mean, we're, we're typically, uh, at our stage, we're not, um, our tip of our clients are not even at that level yet. You know what I mean? That That's a... That's a level that you you eventually get to after years. We, we're, a lot of times we're coming in, and you know that, Kristen, that Google Analytics. You'd be surprised at how many times we go in, and they either have a good, don't have a Google Analytics account, or it's not even connected. So, right. so it's that it's that staged approach. Yeah. Um, it, it can be um, it can be challenging in that respect. So, I mean, if you're coming in at those beginning stages, I, I think a lot of questions that people will probably have is just like, how do they get a better ROI out of it? So do you have any tips on maybe just like lowering the cost per click? Like what, what are some common mistakes you see in people's PPC accounts when you're taking it over? When you're doing similar audiences, uh, they could probably be targeting the wrong geographical areas and then wasting clicks on areas that the client doesn't want the customers to come from. Right. And I think even not, not even talking about how to be creative with similar audiences in uh, Google AdWords or lookalike audience in Facebook. What I, what I think people don't even understand is how 
revolutionary these two concepts are and these uh, marketing features that are now available through Facebook and AdWords because you know, with search, you type in a search query for your problem and looking for a solution, you get paid ads, you get limited real estate, you get about uh, 22 to 26 spots that these paid ads and organic and maps is gonna show up on. But the great thing about um, similar audience and lookalike audience on Facebook is now you're in a predictive nature. You're taking the IDs and the uh, web browsing history and the likes and dislikes in Facebook and all this data that they have and you're uploading your current client list and now you can put ads in front of people that have never even searched your product, never even typed it in Google and your ads are gonna come follow them around. It's, um, it's incredible and that's why you see the, the click-through rates are through the roof compared to regular display ads. Um, maybe some questions around some of the, the basic stuff too, you know, um, could you guys maybe explain like how you, um, you know, set up some of your, your campaigns and ad groups, like, is, do you ever notice that there's sort of like, sometimes not the best naming processes and organization of that, like, yeah. what, what would you recommend to someone like, you know, who's starting out, how should they break down, you know, a campaign name and then how should they break down into an ad group and how many keywords should they have in an ad group, like? Okay, well, I'm lucky because I learned from Matt. And uh, I think Matt's genius is like, he takes very difficult concepts and makes it really simple. And the things he's, the thing that he always tried to fix with me in the last four or five years is, I team seem to take the opposite route, which is like what normal people do. And so he's always trying to help me simplify. And it's always about starting sim simple. Have, have one campaign that's focused on your geographical target area that you want leads from. So if you're a, a orthodontist and you want people that can drive about 20 kilometers or whatever, then don't do all of Toronto. You know, break it down. You just spend the clicks where the people are most likely to become customers. And then keep it simple where you have, you have two campaigns. You have one where people are typing in the, the, the keywords without the local modifier. And then you have one where you name it national, even though you're just focusing on GTA and focus on the keywords that people are typing in the, um, with the local modifiers, the same keywords. So that way you can see the breakup of people that in, in the same area, how they're typing in. And then also have small ad groups. Small, small ad groups, groupings give you more relevance because you have smaller ad groups with smaller uh, batches of keywords attached to more relevant ads. So you get higher click-through rate, which will reduce your cost compared to your competitors and save you money and you'll keep it simple that way. Cool. Some, something else I would like to add, um, for anybody who have massive accounts, like talking about nationwide, um, some of you may or may not know, like companies like McDonald's, Tim Hortons, everything else like that, they'll have like a small little city and that city will be their test city. So if they're ever gonna launch a McCafe or they wanna launch the Double Decker Sandwich or whatever it is, they're gonna pick that city to see what resonates. And they believe that that city represents all of Canada, all of America, whatever that is. With PPC, it's the same idea too. There's no need to actually go out there and if you believe something certain, make sure you have a little test campaign, a little test city that you want to go out there and try so that if you want to change your ad copy or if you want to go test out something else, you have that little city to go out there and see if that will resonate for your other campaigns as well. Yep. That testing period too, is it's amazing how many clients just go full steam ahead, spending a ton of money. Um, I mean, you can, you can have a rule of thumb, maybe spend 5%, 10% of your budget, a total monthly budget for that initial test campaign. It's amazing what you'll learn. And, and also as, you know, as an agency, it does take a little bit of the pressure off and it allows you to sit back and actually invest in understanding um, in that first phase. So there are so many ways that you can, I mean, the stuff that you mentioned was fantastic. What we found though is there's so many things that you're gonna learn in that first month that a client's gonna learn that will feed into how you structure things. Um, that, uh, that that's a really important part of, uh, of the process. Cool, thanks guys. What about uh, tools? I mean, do you guys have any favorite paid tools that you like to use? So um, we're not as, uh, you guys are really sophisticated in terms of your knowledge. Um, we're, for us, we understand the need that we need actually a tool that allows us to spend 20 minutes at the least per day and go in and give us recommendations. We love WordStream. I don't know if any, are you guys are familiar yeah, with WordStream. WordStream is fantastic. Um, frankly, as an agency, 
actually helps us sell to clients because it can it can totally monetize the 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 loss of revenue in an account and also for for us it, it allows us to um, train more effectively because we can have um, our own team members go in and learn when they first start out all the key important things that they need to do to continually optimize an account and that's w- what we found with a lot of clients are there's accounts that are live, but no one is constantly optimizing and nurturing them. So um, WordStream has been fantastic for us. Um, can it be free? Yeah, of course. Uh, Bing Ads Intelligence, uh, you can download at keywords.com. Uh, what it is, is an actual keyword tool that's integrated right into uh, your Excel. Um, so in addition to the usual keyword research tool, we actually break down um, specifically where traffic's coming from. We give you uh, audience and demographic insights. Um, you name it. So just built right into Excel. So keywords.com is my favorite tool. Go to keywords.com. Cool. Um, if you guys could give sort of maybe like, you know, one tip um, that would be, if you know, you could only give one and it would probably give the quickest win to someone's business. You know, what would that one PPC tip be? For me, I would say every single thing that you do on PPC, have it measured to a certain action. So for example, um, it may not be, you may not want to go for the exact sale. That's all right. It might be, I want to have your name sign up for a newsletter. That should be costing something. And if you don't have that number in the back of your mind, use proxies. Use, okay, if I did a road show or if I did a trade show, it costed me X amount of dollars per person. Okay, I want to go a bit lower than that. Or, you know, whether it's a print map or whatever that function or feature is, have that in the back of your mind so you're actually driving towards uh, an idea of what it is that you want to do with your PPC campaigns. Um, for me, it's uh, going back to what Matt's taught is uh, that PPC is, is, is a lot like gardening. It's a lot like pruning and it needs constant, constant care. And if you're not committed to set the time aside to regularly come into the campaigns and, and sift through the keywords, find out what the actual keywords people are coming in on, and split testing your ad creatives and improving every little section every incrementally. Uh, if you're not committed to having that time and that effort, then you shouldn't even bother because you're going to burn money and make Google richer, basically. So I'll, I'll uh, come from it maybe. A, the, there's a lot of technical information. There's a lot of data. There's, there's a lot that is, is flowing through, and it's become a very um, data-driven process, which is great. What we found, and as a piece of advice, is Think about who's actually managing this. And if you don't have someone with a creative sense, someone who can actually write compelling ads, I mean, we have, we have uh, a managers of our social PPC campaigns who are, I mean, graduates from English. So, so let's not forget what actually influences people. And, and it's, it's a combination. We've, we've talked about data and the sciences, but it's also what makes someone take an action. And have them read books about influence. Um, Robert Cialdini is an excellent example in this industry. So let's not forget about the creativity part. I mean, we, we ran an ad once that um, was, it just said thank you in the ad. It was from one of our clients and it just said thank you. It was understated. And this, this girl that works for me, she's just very intuitive. And she just, she wanted to run this understated thank you ad um, reflecting a, a period of turmoil with the client. And it just went, it was unbelievably well received. It was great in the community. It was well done. So. Let's not forget the art. This is also an art here, and that's what uh, that's what can drive conversions and clicks and all that fun stuff as well. Yeah, those are those are really excellent tips. And if I just summarize real quick, you know, you got to track it. Um, you got to take time. It's like pruning a garden. You got to work at it. And the last one here is, you know, don't forget about who your buyers are, the creativity. And I got one last tip too. That that's a quick win for clients if they're not running um, campaigns in Bing yet. The quickest win is literally take your best performing campaigns in AdWords, export them, and import them in Bing. Immediate quick win. And you'll usually get the uh, CPCs or or cost per acquisition down because it's often cheaper. Um, And when you do pay traffic, pay traffic is pay traffic. It doesn't matter where the hell it comes from as long as you get the lowest CPA. So don't forget about Bing, guys. Thanks a lot.